Welcome to section 10.11b. All right, gentle people, in this lecture, what we're going to do is look at temperature dependence and how it affects our thermodynamic values. So let's go ahead and take a look at some equations we talked about. In the last lecture, we said that delta G naught is going to equal negative R T L N K. Now, what we also said is that delta G naught is going to equal delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So I have two expressions of delta G. So what I'm gonna do is substitute one delta G in for the other. So in other words, what I can say is that delta G naught equals minus RT ln K. It also equals delta H minus T delta S. And so what I'm gonna do is just look at this part of the equity. Now, if I go ahead and do that, I can do a little bit of rearrangements and I wanna go ahead and isolate some of these variables out for myself. And the reason that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna go ahead and do a graphical trick. What we like to do when we graph data is we wanna plot our points such that we get a straight line. So a straight line has the equation y equals mx plus b. So here is my graphical trick. On my x-axis, what I'm going to plot is one over t. And then on my y-axis, I'm gonna plot the values of L and K. And so what I'm gonna create is this graph right here. And this is called a reciprocal plot because I'm plotting one over T and have L and K on my y-axis. So when I look at the straight line, I can go ahead and get some valuable information. For example, my slope M is going to equal negative delta H over R. So depending on what the slope looks like, I can tell you if this is an endo or exothermic reaction. So in this case, my slope is positive. And so if my slope is positive, that means my delta H has to be a negative value. And if I have a negative delta H, this is gonna be an exothermic reaction. If this was an endothermic reaction, you would see the plot has the opposite sign for its slope. Now, another thing we can see is the intercept. Now, the intercept is going to equal delta S over R. So if you've ever wondered how they calculated entropy or the chaos of a system, what they can do is this reciprocal plot. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the Van Hoft equation. Now the Van Hoft equation is derived from the equation we talked about in the last slide. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the equation we discussed in our last slide, and I'm gonna measure K2, my equilibrium constant, and T2, the temperature where I do my reaction. Now I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna measure my equilibrium constant and my temperature, but I'm gonna do this at a different temperature. Now, if I subtract one equation from the other, I am left with the Van Hoft equation. And this is what I'm gonna give you guys on your info sheet. The power of the Van Hoft equation is that if I go ahead and do my reaction at a certain temperature and measure my equilibrium constant, I can predict the equilibrium constant at a different temperature, provided I know the delta H. So this is a very powerful equation. The beauty of this is you can calculate equilibrium constants at different temperatures. And so what this means is if you're an industrial chemist, you can go up to your boss and say, okay, we can shift our equilibrium, i.e. make more products or reactants by simply changing the temperature. And remember in an industrial process, changing the temperature is gonna cost you money. So you can tell your boss, is it worth it to change the temperature? So let's go ahead and be industrial chemists and practice this out. Calculate the new equilibrium constant given the following data. All right, gentle people, what we know is that we are trying to calculate equilibrium constants at different temperatures. This is the clue that we should use the Van Hoft equation. 
Now when using this equation, it is really important to go ahead and organize your data. All right, gentle people, what I've done is I've gone ahead and written K1, T1, K2, T2, and delta H and R. Now it doesn't matter what you pick as K1 and T1 as long as you're consistent. What we see in this problem is if I'm at 1150 Kelvin, my equilibrium constant is 0 0.365. Now I could have put these values in for K1 and T1. It doesn't matter if you do this so long as you're consistent and keep the equilibrium connected to the temperature at which it was done at. In this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that I'm solving for K1, the new equilibrium constant, which I wanna evaluate at 1260 Kelvin. Now the R that I wanna use is since we're doing things in energy terms, we are gonna use 8.3145 joules per mole per Kelvin. And so now what we can do is put our delta H. And what you'll notice is delta H is usually given in kilojoules. So it's a, it's a good idea to change your delta H into joules. So I'm gonna write it as 198,000 joules per mole. Now that I've got all of this in, we can plug it into the Van Hoft equation. So I'm gonna put my K2 up on top. I'm solving for K1. Be very careful of this negative sign in the Van Hoft equation. It is often forgotten. I'm gonna put in my delta H and I'm gonna go ahead and put in my R. I'm gonna go ahead and put in my temperatures, making sure to put them in the appropriate place. So T2 first and then T1. Now that everything is set, I can go ahead and solve for X, my K1, and what I get is 2.225. I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe, M1B.